Hello, I'm Hugh Richmond. When I first came to California and started to teach Renaissance drama, I was a little nervous about how effectively I could evoke the Elizabethan theatre and Shakespeare's London. Modern California seemed so remote and far away from those times, even though Francis Drake did manage to reach Northern California in 1579. However, I soon began to realize that the Spanish the Southwest and California does provide a link between the old world and the new. I began to see the broad outlines of a shared body of Spanish and English dramatic traditions that connects the old world and the new. Conventional history of the Renaissance usually highlights the conflicts of Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but these two seafaring nations shared many cultural affinities. What Spain brought to the New World in drama and theatre had broad European roots. Let's first look at the Spanish legacy in California and the Southwest, before turning to the Anglo-Hispanic traditions of Renaissance drama from which it emerged. Our Shakespearean connection begins with the religious drama that Spanish conquistadors and missionaries brought to the New World. These religious plays, the pastorellas and pastores, dramatizing stories of the nativity, were written and performed for the indigenous communities surrounding the Spanish missions throughout California and the Southwest. I became aware of this still vibrant tradition of popular religious drama in visits to her daughter at the University of Texas. In crossing New Mexico with its ancient missions, both ruined and restored, we discovered that Santa Fe's Museum of Folklore preserves a collection of over a hundred scripts of religious Hispanic folk plays based on local oral traditions. In Texas, with its many missions, we even found our son-in-law had performed in such plays as a child. These religious folk plays were an intrinsic part of Hispanic and tribal culture in the Southwest and have now been revived, as shown in this recent documentary from New Mexico. Here, in this remote land of magic and miracles, three distinct cultures, Indian, Hispanic, and Anglo, have put generations of conflict behind them and melded in a spiritual bond that reaches its finest hour in the celebration of Christmas. Many years ago, there was another popular Christmas tradition, the performance of an ancient morality play, Los Pastores. The play, which followed the shepherd's journey to see the Christ child was brought to the Southwest in the 17th century by Catholic missionaries as a way to teach their religion to the native people. As I was growing up, the religious aspects of, uh, of my upbringing were pretty much Americanized, uh, pretty much standard Catholic, I suppose, uh, outside of the Luminati, yes, but there was uh, this whole oral tradition that was uh, expressed to me by my grandmother, my great-grandmother, of how things uh, were in the old days. Early evidence of Los Pastores lives on in books and letters and in a handful of aging photographs. In 1905, I accompanied a friend to one of these performances. We climbed a little hill where I was surprised to see many lanterns lighting the way. I was told that they were lit every night so that if our Lord should come seeking shelter, he might be shown the way. The performance took place in the open with a large bonfire in the center, the audience on one side and the performers on the other. On Christmas Eve, 1899, we saw Los Pastores at San Rafael, a New Mexican village 100 miles west of Albuquerque. There was no resident priest, so the people were obliged to get up the play themselves without the advice or instruction of anyone in authority. The drama was freely interpreted by the players, 
who added original songs, dialogue, and local references. It was most charming. The plays went in and out of favor for over 300 years, but by the 1920s, they had virtually disappeared. Then, in 1981, two scholars from Taos, New Mexico, Arsenio Cordova and Larry Torres, concerned about their rapidly disappearing cultural heritage, decided to restore some of the old, almost forgotten celebrations of their ancestors, including Los Pastores. It's so nice to have young people interested in it. I think that it plays a big role in what happens in a community. If somebody takes the interest of the historical aspect of the community and finds out and tries to uh, uh, create an appreciation for culture and tradition. I want you standing all the time. Let's see, right here, lean against me. From old manuscripts and fading memories, they pieced together the almost forgotten songs and speeches. I think we know all the lines, and uh, Lucifer and Bartolo think they know all the lines, and all of a sudden, people that are talking to us are telling us about different lines. Like, uh, for example, my uncle uh, gave uh, Larry, uh, Larry and I a line on uh, Lucifer, which was, uh, Mando el sol, mando la luna, mando ese cielo estrellado, y el sol se verá clisado solo con que yo le mande. And uh, Larry looked at, looked at me, I looked at uh, Larry, we hadn't heard that line. It, it just floored us. It just, it just floored us. <laughs> just, where'd you get it? Where'd you get that? Yeah. yeah a, he said that was a standard line. No puede cantarnos unos versos de alguna de la letra que cantaban como... Bueno, y el comienzo donde comenzaba, no, cantaba, no. No soy muy buen cantador, pero no, puedo... Está bien. Cantar. <laughs> uh, primero comenzaba, no. Hermanos pastores, hermanos queridos. Evidence abounds of similar biblical plays performed for communities around the missions in California. We even found the manuscript of a nativity playlet in the Bancroft Library at UC Berkeley, probably written by the Franciscan Florencio Ibanez for performance at the Soledad Mission in 1803. This pastores, or shepherd's play, was translated for Christmas staging by students of Holy Names College in Oakland, California. These lyric affirmations of the nativity are disturbed by a vociferous devil trying to seduce the shepherds and their hermit. How soon, how soon you've shown just who you are. This Spanish playlet by Ibanez includes a dialogue between the hermit and the megalomaniac devil. You need to know that I am great who once created heaven's gate and all within it and the stars, the moon and the sun and all earth bears. I love them all and would seek their good. I'd rescue you from those who would deceive you and I'll prove that I'm God and one of whom to kiss the rod. What use, old fool, are your retreats? Give up your heavy sackcloth pleats and stop your lying fear of life. Accept your parents' money rife with means to help your age enjoy what I, your friend, wish you would employ. This Spanish playlet is very like the early English biblical plays of York and Chester. These plays derive from the medieval tradition of drama that once flourished throughout Europe in England as well as Spain. Here is the original Spanish text, as written by Ibanez, of the devil's scene just shown. Sabrá, <laughs> amigo. Que soy el hombre más poderoso, el que hizo un cielo hermoso, el que lo mantiene hasta hoy. Soy el que hizo las estrellas, a los astros, luna y sol, a las plantas, a las tierras y cuanto en ellas se creó. Soy amante, soy amigo. Que he venido hasta aquí yo a buscaros vuestro bien y no vuestra perdición. 
Os vengo a desengañar y a sacarlos de error con que queréis caminar a lograr dicha mayor, lograr la dicha de verme. Pues yo soy el mismo Dios a quien le debéis rendir toda vuestra adoración. Y tú, viejo anacoreta, ¿no te muestras homicida? ¿De qué te sirvió haber sido en un tiempo recoleta? Deja esa tosca bayeta y ese sayal tan pesado y no estés embelesado en ese libro de engaño. Deja de ser ermitaño y vuelve al siglo pasado a gozar de las riquezas que están gozando tus padres. Y no estés aquí perdiendo la lozanía de tus años, que yo soy amigo fiel y procuro tu descanso. In early plays like this, one can already see some outlines of Renaissance drama, the didactic theme broadly played in an open-air performance for citizens with an appetite for lively spectacle. What Spain brought to the New World already embodied European theatrical traditions. In Spain and England, the open-air popular venues of the medieval religious drama lived on in the Renaissance theatres of Lope de Vega and Shakespeare, which were identical in basic structure. Surviving Renaissance examples in Spain, such as this one at Almagro near Madrid, are still in use. The Almagro Theatre features open-air stage and galleries, and it brings audiences very close to the stage action. Shakespeare's restored Globe Theatre in London, where my students performed Much Ado About Nothing, exhibits the same features and underscores the popular character of much Renaissance theatre. Lope de Vega, in fact, provides the populist aesthetic for the Elizabethan theatre's practices, which Shakespeare only implies, for Lope tells us about the new art of making plays in Spain, where, he says, comedies are written contrary to ancient art, and to give my experience, I have to obey those who can command me in the audience, gilding the errors of the mob. In such popular drama, Lope says, the tragic is mixed with the comic, Terence with Seneca, and this variety gives much delight. And nature, because of this kind of variety, also has beauty. Shakespeare matches Lope's populist writings in As You Like It, Much Ado About Nothing, and What You Will, also called Twelfth Night. Let me bid you welcome, my lord. Being reconciled to the prince, your brother, I owe you all duty. I thank you. I am not a man of many words, but I thank you. Shakespeare's villain in Much Ado illustrates the broadly European scope of Renaissance culture. Messina in Sicily is a setting for Shakespeare's comedy, and the bastard Don John is still there. His statue commemorates his fleet's great victory over the Turks at Lepanto in 1571. Don John was notorious for his savage militarism. As an early advocate of the Spanish Armada, he enjoys a special place in Spanish and English tradition, as confirmed when we found him entombed in the Escorial Palace of King Philip II of Spain, the husband of Queen Mary Tudor of England. Don John's neurotic ferocity is illustrated in a play by Calderon. Now that Galera has surrendered its heaps of ruins, breathing fire to be its own red furnace and its pyre, Rest will never soothe my timeless heart, or make me falter in my quest, or from my purpose swerve apart until my enemy, dead or alive, stretches at my feet. Shakespeare portrays Don John as a grotesque villain, surely because he planned the Armada not just to dethrone Queen Elizabeth, but to ascend it himself after forcibly marrying her rival for the throne of England, Mary Stuart, Queen of Scots. Shakespeare's view is shared by the great Spanish painter Velázquez, who shows his contempt for Don John by characterizing him as a sinister clown. Like Shakespeare, Velázquez was fascinated by such grotesque clown figures and even played a comic countess in drag himself. Though I cannot be said to be a flattering, honest man, 
It must not be denied, but I am a plain dealing villain. Whether hero or monster, the melodramatic figure of Don John suggests how much is shared in Spanish and English theatrical conventions in terms of archetypal characters and plots. Both Lope de Vega and Shakespeare wrote plays about the families of Romeo and Juliet. Indeed, Juliet's nurse has many other Spanish precedents, including the manipulative crone La Celestina, who precipitates the tragic romance of Callisto and Melibea by Fernando de Rojas. Shakespeare was no doubt familiar with the story in its English version by James Mabb. She fell into swoonings and trances, hurling and rolling her eyes on every side, being struck with that golden shaft, which at the very voicing of your name had struck her to the heart. <laughs> the more her throbs and pangs, the more I did laugh in my sleeve, for I knew her fall would be the nearer and her yielding the sooner. Oh, I did dream it would come to this. Like the crone, Juliet's nurse is a go-between. For the gentlewoman is young, and therefore, if ye should deal double with her, truly it were an ill thing to be offered to any gentlewoman, and very weak dealing. commend me to thy lady and mistress, I protest unto thee. Oh, good heart, and in faith I will tell her as much. Oh, Lord, Lord! She will be a joyful woman. What wouldst thou tell her? Oh, that thou you, dost not mark me. That you do protest, which, as I take it, is a gentlemanlike offer. Bid her devise some means to come to shrift this afternoon. There she shall at Friar Lawrence shall be shrived and married. Here's for thy penny. Oh, no, truly, sir, not a penny. Go to, I say thou shall. <laughs> this afternoon, sir. Well, she shall be there. Both Shakespeare and the Spanish dramatists also drew deeply on history for their major characters and plots, as we saw with Don John. One of the most memorable historical queens in Shakespeare is Catherine of Aragon, whose integrity dignifies what may be Shakespeare's last play, Henry VIII, which Dr. Johnson said included Shakespeare's greatest verse. I I've always loved the play, though some suggest it is partly by Shakespeare's colleague John Fletcher. Here is how my students performed this divorce scene in our production of the play. Alas, sir, in what have I offended you? What cause hath my behavior given to your displeasure that thus you should proceed to put me off and take your good grace from me? Heaven witness I have been to you a true and humble wife at all times conformable to your will, ever in fear to kindle your dislike, yea, subject to your countenance, glad or sorry as I saw it inclined. When was the hour I ever contradicted your desire? Or made it not mine too? What friend of yours have I strove to love, though I knew he were mine enemy? Or what friend of mine had to him derived your anger, did I continue in my liking? Nay, gave notice he was from thence discharged. Sir, call to mind I have been your wife in this obedience upward of twenty years, and have been blessed with many children by you. If in the course and process of this time you can report and prove it too, against mine honor ought my bond to wedlock, my duty against your sacred person. In God's name, turn me away, and let the foulest contempt shut door upon me, and so give me up to the sharpest kind of justice. The same speech reappears in Calderon's Schism in England, showing how both dramatists shared admiration for the Spanish heroine, less surprising in Catholic Spain than in Protestant England. Irme a un convento, señor, por religiosa, tampoco. Porque si yo estoy casada, en vano otro estado tomo. Y así, en palacio he de estar a vuestros umbrales propios. Y sabrán, muriendo en ellos, que os estimo y reconozco por mi dueño, por mi bien, por mi rey. 
por mi esposo. Las espaldas me volvéis, no merezco vuestro rostro. Aunque si he de verle airado, por mejor partido escojo no miraros. Muera yo y vos no tengáis enojos. Such archetypal roles in the history plays of England and Spain are closely comparable. Some of these roles derive from the allegorical characters of the morality plays, to which the historical plays are closely related. Renaissance humanists wrote didactic plays like Everyman about human vices such as lying and pride. Shakespeare's Falstaff is such a morality figure in Henry IV, Part I, when he lies about his robbery at Gad's Hill and his loss of the spoils to a disguised Prince Hal. But if I did not fight with 50 of them, I am a bunch of radish. Pray God you have not murdered some of them. <laughs> That's past praying for. I have pepper two of them. Two, I am sure I have paid. Two rogues in Buckram. <laughs> I tell thee what, Hal, if I tell thee a lie, spit in my face and call me horse. <laughs> Thou knowest, my old ward, here I lay, and thus I bore my point. <laughs> Four rogues in Buckram let drive at me. Four? Thou saidst but two even now. Four, Hal, I told thee four. These four came at me all of front and made me thrust at me, but I made me no more ado, but caught their seven points in my target thus. Seven? Thou saidst but four even now. In Buckram? Aye, four in Buckram suits. Seven by these hilts. Or I'm a villain else. We shall have more or none. Dost thou hear me, Hal? Aye, and mark thee too, Jack. Do so, for it is worth the listening to. Well, these nine in Buckram that I told thee of. So two more already. Their points being broken. Down fell their hose. Begun to give me ground. But I followed me close, came in foot and hand, and seven of the eleven I paid. Oh, monstrous! Eleven buckram men grown out of two! But, as the devil would have it, three misbegotten knaves in Kendall Green came at my back and let fly at me! For it was so dark, Hal, that thou couldst not see thy hand! These lies are like the father that begets them, gross as a mountain, open, palpable, why thou clay-brained guts, thou naughty-pated fool, we two saw you four set on four, and you bound them, and masked them, and were masters of their wealth. Mark now how a plain tale shall put you down. Then did we two set on you four, and with a word, outfaced you from your prize. The Mexican-born playwright Alacon shares Shakespeare's moral judgments. Alacon's compulsive liar explains to his valet that he cannot call on the assistance of his acquaintance Don Juan de Sosa because he's just killed him, as he then describes ferociously, only for the supposed victim to walk past in good health. Mas yo por la parte flaca cogí su espada formando un atajo. Él prestó saca. Como la respiración tan corta línea de tapa. La suya corriendo filos. Ja, ja, ja. Y como cerca me haya, porque yo busqué el estrecho por la falta de mis armas, a la cabeza furioso me tiró una cuchillada. Recibíla en el principio de su formación y baja, matándole el movimiento sobre la suya mi espada. Aquí fue Troya. Saqué una vez con tal pujanza que la falta de mi acero ahí hizo muy poca falta. Que abriéndole en la cabeza un palmo de cuchillada vino sin sentido para el uh, suelo. Uh. Pobre Don Juan. Mm. ¿Mas no es este quien viene aquí? 
cosa extraña? Later, following Alacan's example, the French dramatist Pierre de Corneille developed his Le Monteur, a prototype later still for Molière's comedies of extravagant temperament. My own awareness of the Spanish parallels was reinforced when I first saw Dakin Matthews and Taya's company stage The Liar at the Chamizal International Festival of Classical Spanish Drama held annually in El Paso since 1976. The theatrical world of dramatists such as Kidd and Shakespeare was intrinsically linked to that of their contemporary Spanish peers in aesthetic and moral values, as well as literary conventions and theatrical practice. And this cultural affinity was sustained in many later eras and in many different places. In pre-Gold Rush California's capital Monterey, early theaters like The Swan staged Shakespeare and traditional Spanish drama, both religious and swashbuckling, initiating the West Coast theatrical tradition from which we inherited the romantic figure of Zorro. The range of Spanish and American literary cultures is vast, as we're beginning to appreciate. This was just a first step in a much greater exploration.